Congress numbers, Library of Congress information, all that would go here on the copyright page. And this is the typical order we expect. I'll jump back to the top. Half title page, series and title, copyright, and then our contents. Um, here in our contents, we have broken things up a little bit. You may remember from the composition, we've got different you know, front matter TOCs, different unit title TOCs, and different actual um, TOC things. So one thing we're doing here in talking about the design is building in these really big divisions because we want the person to kind of understand, oh, okay, everything here goes under unit one. Everything here goes under unit two. So the designer is kind of deciding, well, I really want to separate these things out so that people understand everything falls under it so that everything kind of hangs together here. Um, you may choose to handle your preface and your front matter and back matter a little bit differently. But in general, if you have different units, different parts, now we're kind of talking about um, hierarchy. How do we want these things to look? What's the function of making this look different from this? And now we're out of the front matter. Once we get out of the front matter, we're gonna make a big sort of section adjustment. I don't know if you guys can see it on my screen right now, but there's a big convention difference. We go from front matter to body of the text. Does anyone have any ideas what, what that might be? And it refers to how we identify the different pages and what you know convention we use to say, well, you know, here's how we see difference between front and back matter, or front matter and body text in a book. Something you'll see in lots of different books. I'll say it relates to the page numbering. You might have an idea of how the page numbering might change from front to body text. Yeah, I'll just real quick say, so typically in these books, we're gonna use Roman numerals. Yeah, correct, Kathy, yeah. We're gonna use Roman numerals for our front matter and we're going to use Arabic numerals for our body text. That's why, let's see, here you might be able to see, you know, this is page, you know, IV, HV, and then when we get into the actual text of the book, we start doing Arabic numerals, so page one, two, three, et cetera. That's something your designer should choose, but again, that's a common convention that we kind of expect to see from everybody. All right, so now we're into the body of the book. We're done with the front matter. Front matter could include additional things like prefaces, introduction, um, dedications, if the author says, you know, I dedicate this to my favorite dog, um, anything like that. Then when we get into unit one, now we're trying to, again, use like visuals to, to explain to the reader, hey, this is a big division. You know, big full color page text, huge text, and then we get into additional things. So this might be some things that you, as a project manager, need to think about building into the book as well. Um, chapter content, learning objectives, summaries, goals, um, and then maybe breaking up chapters. Your again, your authors may just have chapter one, and maybe three other authors have included chapter titles. Well, now we need to start thinking about being consistent and going to the authors and saying, "Hey, we really need you to include these, you know, chapter titles here, or we need you to include your chapter number." Um, you may choose to build in a chapter table of contents if you have it uh, particularly long. Thankfully, there's an InDesign feature that we can use to build these, but it's something that you would decide as a convention to include in your book. These are really good things to call out in the design phase of the book so that you're not building these later on and now all of a sudden you're asking your designer to think up a new thing for chapter contents. What you can decide is, hey, I think it'd be really good to have like a chapter table of contents here. So designer, can you please include that in your sample? It may not even be in your Word document, but now's still a good time to pick these things out. Um, you can start thinking about different conventions in this as well. So in, in typically in textbooks, we're looking at full color books. So we can start using color as like a key as well. You know, in, in this, uh, anything that is what I think I refer to as meta content, which I'm sure is not the best term for it, is using these blue things. So anything that's speaking specifically to the reader about content, about the content, whether it's here's what you're going to learn, or here's what your goals are, or here are your review questions, those are using and those are putting in blue. 
because they can then establish a convention that communicates to the reader, oh, here's an aside that's specifically to me. It's not just about the contents of the book. Decisions that can affect the cost of printing, yes, absolutely. Um, even just the decision to have color versus black and white, a lot of the academic books that we do are black and white. Um, I think, well, largely just to cut down on cost, but I, you know, I, it's a decision for the press. I think I typically expect books like this to be in full color or to have color, especially with uh, your book is going to be very image heavy as well. It just enhances the book um, a lot. And, and one of the things that I like about it as well is that we get this new tool to sort of break up content with. Like I was just discussing, discussing having this sort of color coded thing that can speak to students specifically makes it really easy for them to key in on it or to ignore it and just focus on the main content. So um, it's definitely a decision that will affect your cost. Just like also, if you're deciding to use these you know, really big margins, well, that can certainly drive up the page count, which is gonna drive up the cost. So that would be different if you had really small margins and you could fit more text on a page, so you could kind of get more in there. For a lot of textbooks though, it's not always great. There's an issue of line length and readability. I think it's like 60 characters or so is kind of the optimal characters per line. When you think about, you know, how difficult would it be to sort of read and understand a book that was landscape and had text from one end to the other and your eye is just tracking across the whole thing as opposed to you know, reading up and down a little bit more. So there's an issue of understandability there. You don't want to go all the way across. So sometimes you'll see textbooks that maybe have large margins, but split things up into two columns so that you can have smaller margins, but also not affect the line length. So there are definitely decisions you can make at this stage that will affect the price. But that is a good, um, yeah, that's a good, a good uh, thing to bring up. Because in editing, we can just it can be as long as we want. In ebooks, it can be as long as we want, sort of. Um, but at this stage, now we actually start talking about giving something to somebody, and they're going to say, "Okay, this is twelve dollars a piece, or this is twenty dollars a piece, based on how big it is, all the colors, things like that." Um, okay, I'm going to keep trucking along. So now we start talking about hierarchy of information with your designers. So we definitely want your top level heads to kind of call out from your main text. Here, we're making a decision that well, any of the heads are gonna be a different typeface. So they're gonna call out from the text a little bit more. Our major heads are gonna be big, bold, maybe there's a rule above them. And our, our minor heads are going to be a little smaller but still tied together with that head so that they're in that same system. So here, we have one major head and a B head, a subhead under it, and it's going a little bit smaller, italic, things like that. I'll speak really quickly too, um, and you don't you don't have to follow along because I think this might, you know, cause some hangups on your computers depending on them. But one of the nice things that I'll show you about using InDesign for this, and we'll get into it more uh, in the afternoon session, is because everything is tied together. It's very easy for the designer to say. Oh, you know what, I don't really like the rules. So I'm going to just turn them off. I don't want to use them anymore. And now that decision is maintained across the board. So just to show you here, I undid that. My rules are over there and I can redo the change. And again, that change is kind of carried through throughout the entire book at this point. So anytime there's a head, uh, it's going to be different. I can decide that, gosh, it's a little bit big. I think I want to make them a little bit smaller. And again, because in Word, we compose things consistently. Now we're in control of how every single one of these is designed. So we can see, you know, the functions have changed there. That head now resembles everything else. And it's because we're controlling how these are rendered through these styles, not by the designer coming in or the typesetter saying, oh, that's right, I have to make every head, you know, like tracked out wide. So I'm going to do it to every single head. I think you guys can see if you're paying a typesetter or designer, by the hour, something like that is going to really drive up, like, like Kelly brought up your cost, as opposed to using the system that we've already put into it at the composition stage to then give us the efficiencies later on by controlling all this stuff from one central point, which is going to be these character and paragraph styles over there. I'm going to undo, get my rules back. 
Uh, the same is true of all of our text here, any of our body text that all relates back to these different styles. So we're on the first page of our body text now. We've gone through openers. By openers, I mean our you know, chapter openers, our part openers, uh, and we have this new element down here. Um, you may have these in different places, but they're effectively called the running footers or the running head. So another component of your book, you can kind of think of it like headers in Word, but we can choose to have different pieces of information. So and if we have page number, book title, chapter number, and the uh, chapter title. Now you could, in InDesign, choose to have this automatically generated as something else, because these are just pulled from text of the book. Um, so you may decide, well, I think I don't want the book title here. I want the, you know, section that this book is in, so that whenever the student is looking through it, it's easy for them to figure out which head they're under. So we have these built into InDesign. You can see here there's a sort of nonsense text. I'm accidentally writing things. There you go, really. So it looks kind of like nonsense text. You know, it's just like a little placeholder. And that's because it's a variable. It's what's called a text variable. It's pulling from a certain style. Now I could change that. And again, this is the other kind of efficiency that we're looking to gain in using it this way. Because it's just a single variable, I can tell it to select whatever I want. Um, so I can say, oh, I don't want it to be the book plot. I want it to be the section head. So for every A head, you know, please display it there. You can see it's automatically updated. And now rather than saying the book title, it says the section head. Why is this chapter necessary? And it changes when it comes up to a new one, mathematical functions. And it still says mathematical functions there, differentiation. So this is another aspect that you get to decide in your book, like how are you gonna to signal to the, uh, to the student what section they're in? We're gonna use these running head texts and they can say kind of whatever we want them to say. I think I'm gonna, we're gonna pause for our, our longer break in about a couple minutes. So if there's any questions while I go through the last couple things, please let me know. And I'm gonna to jump to the next major set of elements that we built into the sample. And it shows something that we talked about a little earlier. We just said, you know, why are there two kind of styles for boxes? Like why is there a box style and a sidebar style? Well, here's an example of what you may maybe wanna do with something like that. You can have a sidebar be specifically about the content. So it maybe it's expanding on something. Maybe you talk about Euclid in your math book and you wanna know where Euclidean geometry came from. Maybe you, you know, maybe your author has built in a little bio about Euclid and how he had a dream and came up with geometry. So we're gonna include that as a sidebar from the design standpoint because it's actual book content. We're gonna treat it as red. But maybe over here, we wanna have a little tip to our student so it's blue because we're talking to the student now about how to better use this book for their studies or how to better keep up with the, you know, the text or, hey, you know, don't uh, cheat on tests, things like that that we want to talk specifically to our students about. So there's a quick example of, you know, identifying different types of content in the book, calling it out specifically, and then relating the composition to how it's going to render in the book itself. You know, we have figures now that are placed into our book. We have figure captions placed in the book as well. You may have these, uh, I'll go up here again, you know, built in as a wrap, a text wrap in the book. That can kind of drive up your typesetting time a little bit because then there's a little bit more to balance or you can follow this kind of academic function of top and bottom of the page. In the case of equations, oftentimes they're gonna be built into the actual text itself. Here, we treated this as an image. Um, so this is just sort of placed in line with the text. And then I think we're at the, getting to the end. So here are kind of like closing chapter or material for the book. Again, we're following a decision that the designer made where we're going to treat these as our other sort of spot color, you know, the blue color. We have a big, large full review where you can see that everything kind of should hang together here because it's all using the same font family. It's all using the same variations of the same color so that when the student hits it, they're sort of like, oh, okay, I'm at the end of the chapter. I can see for review. I know that 
you know, they, they're scrolling through and flipping through the book real quick. They can just re easily hit this kind of thing and stop and understand where the book is. So there's some functionality built in there as well. I think we have a couple more minutes before we kind of end. So I'm just going to, there's no examples of this. So I'll just kind of mention that the last thing we talk about is back matter. And back matter would be the content's over. You now know everything about physical chemistry. And we're going to get into appendices, references, maybe it's your index, maybe it's contributor bios or bibliography, all that stuff that we would consider a uh, back matter in the book. No change in page numbering for back matter text, um, but you would start changing maybe the kinds of composition you'd hit. So, you know, your index is going to be a CTBM for chapter back matter. Uh, that option is there so that maybe you want to change how your you know, heads are rendering, you know, your front matter heads and back matter heads versus your body chapter heads. Um, they could look different, again, as a key to the reader, but this is a different kind of element. So are there any questions just about parts of the book? I tried to make things pretty general, um, just give you a quick overview of different things that you might see or consider building into your book. And I'll stop the share because I'm done with this.